Welcome to the Zeph Report. Today is March 23rd, 2013. We have uh, just um, witnessed one horror upon another and one blessing upon another in juxtaposition and conflict, and we're trying to find our way through it. So sit back, relax, no worries if the Lord wants you to have it. He'll just give it, 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 just give it. You can find us uh, on the weekends on WWCR, 13 point, uh, I, I can't remember now, but uh, on the weekends, or at zefdaniel.com, zedjaw.com, zefdaniel.podbean.com. specific about why things happen. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of incense which came from the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail mingled with fire, mingled with blood. And there were cast upon the earth and a third part of the trees were burnt up And all green grass was burnt up, and the second angel sounded, and, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the stars called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many died of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, And the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which have yet to sound. Okay, now obviously a lot has to take place before chapter 9. That's chapter 8 is the seventh seal. And then the fifth angel sounds, and the star falls upon heaven to the earth, and then and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great form, furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke loc- locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions upon the earth have power. 
And it goes on about the locust. One woe is past, and behold, two other woes are going to come after this. And the six angels sounded, and I heard from I heard a voice from the horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, and and which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay a third part of men. And that's the second third, so that would be two-thirds. Okay, and then uh, just kind of summarizing a bit here as we move into chapter 10. And I saw another mightily angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face, as it were, the sun, his feet were pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book, and he, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer, but the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake to me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open at the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, And as soon as I had eaten it, it, my belly was bitter. And he said to me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So here we have the events um, to the end. Okay. And um, then we back up again. And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein, but the court which is without the temple leave out, and don't measure it. For it is given to the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty two, forty and two months, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred <clears throat> and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. And there appeared another great wonder in heaven, chapter 12. A woman clothed with the sun, okay, the birth of the man-child. And then chapter 13. And I stood upon the the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven horned heads and ten horns, uh, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Okay, so this New World Order thing comes... And we've already had an overview of the two-thirds of people being dead and the earth being hurt and the waters being killed and beasts being killed and all that. And um, as far as the timing of that, uh, it, it also says that God, you know, and I saw God end it all up. So obviously it didn't end all up right there. It resets again. And then we're looking at it from this point of view. So these woes that have come, um, they would come as a series of woes to the end. But what we have here is this um, blasphemy of God of the ten crowns and seven heads, uh, the beast, if you will, the beast system. And it really eventually leads us to the fall of Babylon in chapter 18 and the mark of the beast and, you know, the Antichrist and 666 and all that. So at what point, my question then would be to you, at what point... Do we say that these events, these woes occur? Do you say they occur before the rise of this beast in Babylon, which is to be struck down by chapter 18? Or do you say that the events from chapter 8, uh, the seven angels, and the, the fire mingled with blood and the great mountain of burning fire into the sea, 
and a third part of the sea, which are, which would be the second third part of the sea. And, and you know, because these things, you know, the rocks had already fallen. The seals were opened already. A lot of people have already died. Then more, and many died of the waters with wormwood. And then other woes coming in chapter 9, etc. cetera. And, um, and then finally, the little book, which is basically the little book is for John to prophesy to the nations. So it, it's basically taking a time out or a pause here and or saying these are the things that are going to happen. Now go prophesy all this to the nations. And then we back up in chapter 11 to the two witnesses and the Antichrist and all that and then build to chapter 18, which is finally the fall of Babylon, motivated by simply one, one thing. The fall of Babylon is motivated, you know, not just by blasphemy of the Lord, but it is vengeance. That's the one motivation in the whole story that is consistent. And so the Lord takes vengeance upon the earth. At the same time, we see uh, pictures of, the, of uh, all the saints in heaven and the 144,000 and the lamb and the wrath of the lamb and the um, resurrection of uh, all the beings of God. And then the punishment of those who blasphemed against God, who went obviously with the devil. We see the devil being thrown down onto the earth uh, during the um, period of woes. And we see that he uh, uh, is energized. A lot of people think, okay, that's when the anti You know, what I'm leading to is, um, is this that time? You know, because I'm summarizing. I'm not digging deep into the chapter and anything. So we've been through this a million times. The point is, we have all these events. We have, it's actually a triple ganger. We have it in the first six chapters, the six seals. We have the seventh or crowning seal, which is the crowning finishing seal in chapter eight, which shows a finishing of everything in chapter nine. God's work is finished. And then then we see the little book, which John is to prophesy to the nations. He's been given prophecy and the gift of prophecy of all these events. And that's what I believe the little book is. It's just like, like giving him the power to prophesy that, you know, if you need to come out of her, my people, you need to repent. If you belong to God, you need to belong to God and not sign on with the devil and so forth. Well, then, obviously, uh, then we have a picture of the two witnesses and eventually the rise of the Antichrist, which, and it doesn't say this, but presumably this would be before two-thirds of mankind is dead. And then there's more. Um, when it gets to Armageddon, dead. So it ends up being about 90, I don't know, 91% of the population of the earth. And uh, there's a lot of people that believe that we are in this time right now and that this is what is really happening. And I am here to say that, uh, you know, it's weird because... As I look at this and as I ask the Lord what to tell you and what to tell myself, you know, I'm seeing <clears throat> how these waves of revelation come. And I can just get to the bottom line of the whole thing right now. Because this kind of karmic debt is true in every generation. Every generation deserves to be killed. At least two-thirds, three-quarters, 99%, whatever. Every generation. The 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 The... The, the civilization that turns from God is eventually punished and liquidated. The people in power who run for office want the United States, for example, to be liquidated. That's why they run for office, because they're destructive people, and they're drunk on power, and they're drunk on the devil. And so they run for office because it's more power. But their goal is to destroy themselves, their own families, and everyone else, take everyone else with them. They don't know that's their motivation. When they go to work every day, they think they're doing good. You remember um, that that most people believe they are doing good. They don't believe they're doing evil. You know, they believe they're doing good. And um, you know, now I'm going to try to go to the to this other chapter. I want to go to John one it looks like i'm going to go to chapter one let's see if this can do it well there it is beautiful Uh, so in in one john he says 
That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you the, that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that we also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. Okay. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And he showed me this two nights ago, and I'm going to share that with you. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Amen. And if we say we have no sin and deceive ourselves, then the truth is not in us. If we confess if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, just right off the bat is the faith and the walk and the, and the way and the truth and the life right there just kind of summarized that God is light and in him, there's no darkness at all. And this is really the point of uh, this understanding today, because he showed me for over several hours how the conflict of darkness versus light of the Satanists really, it really, when we say that we mean the Satanists, let's be clear about who we mean. They are confirmed Satanists in halls of power that rule over the earth. Okay, they're not atheists, they are not agnostic, they are not pagans, as a lot of people mistake. They are structural Satanists. Let's be very, very sure we understand that, because that's the key to understanding the whole world. Without um, l being clear on the labels, on the structure, one will miss that it will become a gaggle of confusion. And that's, you know, what the devil would like to do. And, you know, the devil is a real being. And uh, the question that we have overarching question today is, is he here or not? <laughs> and if he is, then this is the wrap up, right? And, um, but he's always here working through the minions who worship him. When one becomes a Satanist, they literally sell their soul to the devil in exchange for power, position, career, whatever. That would tend to, um, that would tend to, to, to show me there's many of them, that they would be more the majority than the minority. I'm not talking about clowns like Anton LaVey and how everyone runs after that going, see, there's the three Satanists over there. I'm like, he's just there as a distraction. What are you talking about? Wearing his stupid robes and shaving his head and doing his goatee and trying to look like this evil Satan guy. Give me a break. I mean, he may do all the hedonistic stuff and whatever, but I mean, give me a break. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, uh, the bread maker, the accountant, the lawyer, the, the basic population of people. That's what we're talking about. I don't know what they're talking about. I do know one thing. They distract us. They distract us with that, oh, here's Anton LaVey. And oh, here's the Satanic Bible. Well, there may be Satanic things in that Bible, but BS, that's not, all that is, is a distraction from the truth. We're talking about structural, initiated, contractually signed, intentional, free will engaged Satanists and nothing else. We're talking about those that have created the political climate of war and abortion, let's say, you know, doing the bidding of the fallen angels. We're talking about people who are, you know, have allowed themselves to be f extensions, you know, willing vessels for, uh, for them to inhabit as they will, according to their plan, the fallen angels, Satan, whatever that there's a game plan there. We're talking about the majority because I asked the Lord, you know, this darkness, I mean, you're good, Father, and everything from you is good. And then we have this. And so little questions like, will there be reform in the churches? 
and he and he told me the churches don't that you're speaking of do not exist. They don't exist. So, so what do you mean they don't exist? And th the answer is the people there, the, the basic structure of it doesn't exist. And the, the majority of the people there do not have a relationship with God in any way, shape or form. In fact, they don't exist because they already made their deal with the earth and with the devil and all that. And then they, they're there. It, the, it comes from the satanic side. So there is no... Um, it's more when it, as I as I I saw this vision and I watched this thing progress until finally it wasn't a war against opposites at all. That's the misnomer. We think it's just you know the devil versus God, light versus dark, and no, it's not. It's something that he's creating with his people and 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 bringing them through because he's all light and all good. And I was shown how that as we go with him and as he brings us through this, we become light as he is light. The new Jerusalem is light. He is light. The consummation is light. And it's just, there's all light and no darkness. And so this situation upon the earth would be almost like the opposite of what there is. And it's that way for a purpose because we need maximum darkness to yield maximum light. And at the same time, this is not the end all and be all. This is a gateway, if you will, a birth canal into eternity, into light. And... Um, so when I get back to the earth and what's going on here and the misperception therein, and we look at all this, this information about, uh, you know, about, about people speculating and will there be reform in the church and this and that, we went through it. We went through the church and the people of the earth and the kingdoms of the earth. And we found that there wasn't anything like that with God. In other words, the people that are sold out to the devil, if you will, and uh, who work in the, you know, the global system. It doesn't matter what country. It's all the same, same issues, same. It's all the same. So basically these people that are there are not seen and not heard from in the same way that if you tried to work in their industries, let's say, and the most you could become is an invisible janitor. <laughs> Um, it's not that, you know, it's not that they're trying to be mean to you necessarily, although they will if you get on the radar screen, if you're, if you're not one of them, because that's their program to do that. But it's that you don't exist. It's like, um, when I, when I've done things, it's like, oh, oh, you thought you were, uh, uh this, you thought you were that. And then you produce work and everyone ignored it. It's like, because you weren't seen, you're not, you don't exist. I was told. And I'm like, Okay. Then the Lord showed me, and I accept that. By the way, I'm I'm and I'm good. I'm not only good with that. I'm great with that. Thank you for that. I don't want you to see me. And the, on the Lord's side, I'm seen and known, and I have a place. And He knows my name, and I have uh, my own ranking, if you will. And I have all that. I have a whole life with the Lord, a whole situation that mirrors what they've got. And the Lord showed me how in this situation, I am somebody and beloved. And if that's the case, and John speaks more about this later, and I'm going to get into that. As that's the case, uh, then there could not be, I could not be visible or seen over there. It's one or the other. Their twain does not meet. So um, in the Lord... I'm loved, I'm visible, and I'm known, and I'm known to the brethren. I'm, I'm not known like some big mucky muck. We're all the same. That's kind of one, one of the nice benefits is nobody has a ranking over anybody else, you know, and that's, that's pretty awesome because when I watch what they do, I'm just, it's, it's just sickening. Um, and I actually did something where I was in a restaurant and, you know, this was a long time ago, 2002 with uh, Frank Whalen and company and I did a book signing and then we were having a little dinner sitting at a table and I wanted to show them how I, I was invisible. So I went to each table in front and this was kind of showing off in front of friends, but I was waving in their face. I was acting like I'm the waiter to take their order. You know, I was doing all this stuff to get their attention and they wouldn't look at, they wouldn't look at me. 
And the people who were at the table were marveling at that and going, that's, Z is invisible. They can't see that he's right there uh, at each table. I only did, you know, three tables or so, but I mean, I made the point. And um, I'm thinking too of how Jesus would slip away time and time again. He became invisible. He had the same invisibility that I just manifested myself. I didn't do it as a power. I just walked over there. I didn't go, let's conjure it and then we'll go do it and torture ourselves like they do. I just did it. And it just was what I said it was. And they marveled at it. And, you know, it's like, but what can you do? If that's the way it is. Well, contrastingly to that, and we give too much credence to the world or the, or the, I'm sorry, not the earth, but the society of, of, of Satan, which man is enslaved to. And he is allowed to operate where, you know, in that world, you would be invisible as well. But in our world, okay, in God's world, in the world of his children, the people of the earth, it's not that they're just going to not do so well and be poor. They're not really, you know, and it, this is not across the board because the Lord has his wealthy people as well. So, but it is to say that there is no existence of them. Now, I was also shown that when we are in the same room together, say you were in the same room with a churchianity person. Eventually, it must come to blows as it has every time, 100% of the time that I've been involved. It always comes down to blows. It always comes down to an argument, a conflict. I just, you know, I went and tried to be on the best behavior I could when we went to, to we were doing a charity function and we were staying at these, as a guest of these people in their house. And I was just sitting there and, and they just completely manifested. They went insane. And I was thinking I wasn't even going to get through the night over there. Maybe we should just leave. But we did. And, and you know, eventually the guy takes me, you know, this guy that was staying with the, the, the father of the household or a complete um, loser, in our opinion, in our opinion. He takes me to his office and he's like an he's like an engineering contractor of some sort. And he's doing like a $12 million deal that's coming through his fax machine at that time. And he goes, I think everyone should be doing this. Meaning, you know, this, meaning, you know, he was taking a great offense with me not doing this. And I said, uh-huh, uh-huh, cool. You know, hey, good for you. You got your $12 million deal. Excellent. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, <laughs> it was just a, 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 an incredible, horrific uh, situation. That, and, and like I said, I was on, trying to be on my best behavior. And the Lord showed me how every single time, and since then, of course, every, you know, really since the Lord put me on his, uh, activated me, if you will, it's been like that. Um, when you're around a world, you cannot be around one of them. And, and ju this means anybody in the world, quote unquote, because it will eventuate in a, um, it's the same, look, it's not personal on your part. It's not personal on their part. It just happens the same way when you take a, uh, you know, a metal object and, 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 and connect it from the positive to the negative charge on your car battery. That will blow your car up. You know, one, it's physics is what I'm talking about. One is on one, you know, is one thing physically, you know, electrically. And one is another. And they don't, usually the Satanists have no, especially men, have no awareness of themselves because it's the Jezzies that run it. They have no awareness of, you know, the philosophy or, you know, f they don't have feelings really. It's just kind of rote. You know, it's, it's um, they don't really have a, um, they don't look into the depths of this thing with analysis. So they can be used. In other words, they just know they're blowing up and they're angry because you are not one of them and they're not one of you and, you know, God damn you or whatever. It's just like, it becomes this uh, insane fight. And after quite a number of those kind of things, uh, because at the churches, we had the same thing. You can't be there if you belong to God, because it's just a physics thing. It will not work. You know, even if you're on your good behavior and you don't say anything to anybody, they, it will, you will be ejected because it's, they can't have a short circuit, which is what happens. It's a physics problem. It has nothing to do with man or his will. It is... It is God's physics. When you 
your free will gets you there. But once there, there is no connection. Well, let's say that you went into a, um, a place of the world and you got along just fine. Then obviously you would question yourself and wonder, you know, and, and if you kept on going, then, then you would not be in a relationship with the Lord. If you were, there would be a conflict and a thing would be ruined. They, due to physics, have never taken one that is of, of the Lord. And the Lord has never taken one that physics-wise is on their side. This dividing line is, though accessible by free will, is a physics dimensional portal difference. One is day, one is night. There is no twain. There's no compromise possible. It's, you know... um, and so, therefore, leading to the next point and doing it as logically as I, as I can this morning. Um, therefore, we who are with the Lord are with the Lord and comprise the church of Jesus Christ. However, when asking about them, he said they are not here physically. They are not visible Physically, they are not hearable physically. Though you can't see it, it is science, not opinion, not spiritual foo-foo stuff. This is hardcore physics. Though man doesn't see the connection between free will and physics, there is one. And free will isn't really free anyway. We, that's just kind of like a misnomer. But, I mean, we can. Get, that's not the topic here. Um, so I asked them about revival in churches, and they said, there aren't any. What you're talking about isn't. He didn't say isn't church. He goes, isn't. It doesn't exist. What exists is light. As we walk in the light, as he is light, that's, that's existence. There is nothing else outside that that is existence. That's the technical answer. But how can there be this world that we suffer from and that we're involved in and there seems to be no escape from and they torment us night and day? It's a physics issue. They don't, it's not personal. It's the same thing as if there's a menace, you know, like if you feel there's a demonic force, you pray to cast it out. Right. It's the same thing when you're if you're around one of them, because they don't. In other words, you you don't exist there. And they don't exist. Where you are, if you go there, then you are uh, it, it, the equivalent is a short circuit and they will manifest even if they don't know you. The the thing that's in them will jump from one to another. Let's call that the all-seeing eye. I think that's a... And they will speak to you in different voices and things if you don't leave and threaten you and or come up with things about your life or mock you or something. Even if you were goody two-shoes perfect, even if you were um, just trying to blend in, there is no blend because you're talking about two completely different opposing realities neither of which has anything to do with the other one. And as we are conflicted within, you know, we have like, you say light and dark, and, you know, we have a, we have a conflict. The thing I'm talking about is more of a scientific or physics problem than, you know, I'm, going, I'm a little more with the angels today, a little more with the devil tomorrow. It's not, not really having anything to do with you, with your conflict. That's something that is uh, necessary for now to be healed. Because remember, all is light. As he is the light, that's all anything is. That's all we are going to is going to the light. That's all the the process is about, going to the light. In him, there is no darkness at all. So if you're of the darkness, you couldn't be in him. So the things and the institutions of man and whatnot, although we deal with them when we can. And now, even in like family situations where everyone's trying to be on their good behavior and you're trying to have like a, a turkey dinner or whatever, it, you know, it will be strained you know, at best, and hopefully nothing will manifest and you might get through it. But I mean, there's, you know, this, when you have conflicts in families, it's always because there's 
Some of the family are on one side, some are on the other. But one side, i.e. the devil's side, if you will, those conform to the world, whatever you want to say, the conformists, they don't exist with God. So there's no revival necessary. That's my point. That's the point of the, of the, of the wording I had. There is no need to talk about revival because there's no need for revival and there's no revival that will take place because the thing you're talking about does not technically exist. You can't have a re-something if it never was in the first place. So the external manifestations of civilization, for whatever reason, because uh, this is the way God set it up, have to, by their very nature of existence, be affirmed and controlled by Satan as proven in the Gospels when he said he had the power to give Jesus all the institutions of the world, all the kingdoms of the world. So he obviously owned all those. All the kings and queens, all the presidents, all the congressmen, all the senators, all the rock stars and entertainers and sports figures, all the economists and philosophers, all the cities and all the politicians they're in, and all the corporations, and all the honchos, and everybody owes its existence and structure, though corrupt, to having to make some kind of, you know, compromise, which means that it, it if you want to put it in, you know, kind of another term, we could say that it, that profanes it. But then they will tell you, come on, Z, to exist, I have to profane it. And then I'm, and it's like, to exist where? To exist in the world you do absolutely have to profane it. It must be born of profanity. Not meaning cussing, but profanity meaning not sacred. It must be born without God to be acknowledged and approved because if you tried to do something that was just pure with God in a physics area where God doesn't exist technically then what would happen is it would not stand. They would have to infiltrate it and make it their own. It's just, it's a, it's a natural law, is what I mean. And it's not personal. It's not, it's not a failure on your part if you really, really tried. Um, and what I found the solution to that is in the world, uh, the Lord is good to guide his people through the world and to give them you know, work and to give them uh, careers and to give them all kinds of things, you know, and, and, but they have to trust him. If you belong to the Lord, like the, in, in my walk, the Lord actually demands that I don't strive at anything, that I have no goal. <laughs> I guess that's dangerous for me personally to have goals or be competitive, but I, I, I'm, it's forbidden to me and I'm forbidden to worry about it. In other words, what he gives me, I'm to be happy with that. Oh, it's, if it's a lot, great. If it's a little, great. Whatever it is, I'm to be, whatever thing I do, I'm to yield to him and ask him where to go. Because in this world, I don't, it's not, this is, it's a, and also this is a temporary manifestation. As we see in the book of Revelation, we see beyond. The whole goal, the whole movement of the Bible is to the light. From the darkness to the light. So the darkness is waning and their power is waning. And, you, you know, the earth Every once in a while, the civilizations upon the earth come to realize that they have no power and they come to realize they don't exist. So they'll go to war to justify their existence, if you will. And, um, you know, they'll conflict with each other. And ultimately, those that you say you don't exist there and there's a there's an automatic conflict. They're also busy stabbing each other in the back because, you know, the whole nature of being a player in the world is to be a game player. And to be a game player, you must really stab people in the back. Uh, you, you've you got to be like a Machiavellian kind of person to wield the forces of Earth to your favor. And eventually that becomes who can be the most ruthless, who has the most power and might. Who can, You know, what it really comes down to is who can put somebody six feet under and not get in trouble for it. Because they have so much power, even the police are afraid of them. And that's the top of the heap. And I've seen that close up and personal. It's, that's something you don't want. That is a recipe for sorrow. So it seems to me, given this physics problem, and given that, um, and you have free will. I mean, the people that choose the Lord, they are on the Lord's dimension. I didn't even get any of this kind of conflict until I'd really firmly committed totally my whole life 
and being to the Lord. And then I noticed that this this situation I've been thinking about for a decade or two, that this has, that's when it really came about to where it was in your face. Not until then, you know. And, uh, and they get so mad, and it really it becomes irrational because you, you're sitting there being calm, not arguing about anything. Not, and they'll come out of the blue and say, are you the only one? You think you're better than us? What? Hey, hi, Uncle so-and-so. Hey, how you doing? And, and that's the greeting. Because um, he can't stop thinking about you and the fact that you're with the Lord and that he's not. And he knew better. And he's just so mad. He wants everybody. You think you're the only one, meaning he wants everybody there. No exceptions. And the whole goal of Satan in that is to cancel God's need to, to make everything invisible so God can just go away. That's a strategy. Just like making the nation so apostate with these idiots that are running things, who I completely disrespect. There's, I don't think any normal conscious person would respect in any way, shape, or form, people that whose goal is to destroy. And I don't, I don't respect destroyers, self-destructive people, or the self-aggrandizement and uh, pompousness of the president and his, and his uh, you know, overreaching uh, with, with while well, people are being thrown out of work and unable to find work, lavishing themselves like uh, Louis XVI and uh, Antoinette. It's just thoroughly disgusting. And thoroughly, you know, I wouldn't want filth like that around me, you know? So to me, it's like there isn't any rank because the Lord shows me there's, you know, a man is worthy of his rank based on his character. His character is what he does, not what he says. And if they show you that they're scoundrels or that they belong to the devil or whatever, it's, you know, you can respect them as, you know, they're there and you have to say hello and goodbye. You know, you're not mean to them. When I say respect, that's not a good word. I mean, more like acknowledge, and so many people get caught up in thinking everything is everything. Everything's the same. I'm going to pray for everyone that doesn't really see it my way. It's like, well, you're wasting your time. Oh, you're wasting your time. That's completely unbiblical and untruthful. You people that do that are um, completely deluded and shows me that you're still with the world and haven't really don't have a relationship with the Lord and you're not saved in any way, shape or form. Here you are, the unsaved and the unwashed, praying for other people that they'll get it when you yourself have zero relationship with the Lord. Ho, 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 ho. Uh, but it's so thick like that. Everywhere I look, it's so much like that that I can't, I can't look anymore. I just, even if I was blind, I can go by the feeling of the vibe, you know. You know when they're there. You know when they're not there. You know, when it's there and it's around, you know, when it's not there, you know, you can feel it. And what I'm trying to tell you is it's not personal. You know, um, it's not personal to you and, you know, your opinion. You're trying to be good. You're not trying to be a bad guy. You're not trying to think ill or evil of the other guy. And I don't either. I don't want to pre. It's like with me, when it pops up, I'm like, oh, Wow. Gee, I didn't, you know, I was treating you open-handedly and with trust as a brother. And look, okay, later, you know. I, we, he didn't intend it. I didn't intend it. Everyone was trying to be good. But there it is. And so it's like, then that limits the amount of contact and the amount of trust that there could be. Um. Let's just say the amount of contact, I, you know, I have to trust in the Lord. And, you know, he tells me that I've got to deal with people that are some of them sold out to the devil 24 hours a day and I got to deal with them. But there's a, a formal way that that we try to deal that does not. For example, I'm not going to pray for that person because they don't exist yet. Meaning they don't have a repentant heart or they're satisfied with where they are and that's fine it would be a waste of my time and it would be a it would be a um, uh, it would be a mocking of god actually for me to because god hasn't chosen that person he hasn't tapped that person he hasn't drawn that person and you know i might get a thing like from the lord like well not yet on this one or yes on this one not yet on that one otherwise i'd be 
I don't know what I'd be doing if that if it wasn't discer- if there was no discernment involved in it. I don't know. Just everything's everything, baby. I'll just pray. Start praying for my robot. I'm going to pray for my light bulb. This physics issue, though, what I'm trying to tell you is not to take it personally. In other words, when you go into some situation and there it is, oop, there it is, you're just going to have to politely you know, dust your sandals off and withdraw yourself. Conversely, you can go into a situation where there's confusion, where people really want the Lord, but they're just not quite sure and they're, you know, they've been in the world. And uh, the, l- Listen, don't kid yourself. The world still has them and is trying to figure out a way, or Satan is, to... to or, or the demons or whatever is around motivating it. Um, figure out a way to strategize using that person to deal with you. And um, part of that strategy may be to be a nice guy, to, be not, to, to, to not have a conflict or to, to bring you into confidence. And it's best, and I think that's why Jesus taught us to not be judgmental. Because when you're judgmental, in other words, if, if, if I go into a situation like that and I go, oh, cool. Hey, bros. Hey, whatever. Hey, what's happening? And then, then eventually it, you see a disaster. The, the, the way to avoid that is to not make a judgment one way or the other, to not be judgmental, to not be judge, jury, and executioner. Just don't be, just have no opinion and yield to the Lord as to what to do or what the purpose of it is. What's the purpose of this contact? What's the purpose of this situation? Lord, Father, I put it in your hands. And then I walk with trust. See, we don't want people to get paranoid and to say, well, I'm not going anywhere and I'm not going to do anything because, see, it's all, you know, they're the majority out there and they're going to get me and there is no connection. And so I'm just going to wait here for the Lord. No, that's not going to happen. The Lord wants us to walk through it as actors. He wants us to flaunt it, our happiness, the cause of uh, our, our, our joy. Sin, in the case of someone sold out to Jesus, will open the door for the other side to kick your butt and good, meaning to get a hold of you, to bring up past sins, to accuse you of being such a loser and, and, and the rest of it. And that you, you'll even get letters from people out of the blue that will just accuse you of being a, a hypocrite, liar, louse, whatever. You'll be just like, wow, you know, what did I do? And the answer is you sin. What's, what's the biggest sin? Um, self-regard. In other words, where was God? Why didn't you, ref- no, no, not, not understanding that you need him every second of the day just to get through the day, if you're one of his, because you're in a hostile territory. And how could you be so stupid as to do that? So here we're going to show you exactly what the stakes are and what could happen to you should you simply drop your guard like that again. So anyway, I just wanted to share with you this uh, divide that uh, I'd thought about it for a long time before really speaking on it. And I realized the, the main comfort I have from this word is that it's not of human making. It is physical, something God made. Um, to divide the sheep from the goats, whatever. I don't know his purpose. I just know that he also showed me how we, how everything is good. All this eventually yields to the light. You know, this eventually, it all goes to the light individually in our our lives as we go toward death. We go into the light. We're, We're being birthed. Life is really death. We're actually dead and in the process of being birthed. And, um, birth and existence is light. So what you see, you can't really buy into so much. It's not really, you know, I, I look at, see, I'm on an airplane, okay? I'm flying over the water. You know, I don't want it to crash. I'm hoping it, you know, gets me to where I want to go. And then when I get there, I go, oh, that's pretty cool, an airplane. And it just took me across thousands of miles of Pacific Ocean. And here I am in Hawaii. Boy, that's really something cool. You know, and look at this medical device. It can do this, that, and the other thing rather than the barbarous practices of old. And check this out. This has really made my life better. And it's like, yes, you know, the, the man is given free will and also creativity and to be having instincts of God to be a creator. But in all these things I mentioned, there's always the inherent corruptions or flaws, right? The airplanes break down. 
the uh, knowledge keeps changing. It's not quite perfect yet. You know, there's always a corruption within mm. all the good things. And if you like, you can think of humanity. People think of humanity and they're, they're in sorrow because they're just going to... And I understand there's like a... It's like, no, the Lord already is standing in eternity. So he knows who's his... You, you know, if if a lot of what you're perceiving isn't really created or isn't doesn't exist, then, you know, it's almost like we're going through this artificial kind of manufacturing process, you know, and you just can't take it too personally. And, you know... If you need to weep for humanity, go go ahead. But then that's the role that God had for you to do. Already decided before you were born. Nothing that you do is a surprise to the Lord and nothing you choose is a surprise to the Lord. Everything you choose, everything you say, everything you don't say, everything you do and everything you don't do. Everything, the sum total of all things that is your life was preordained from the beginning. Known already by the Lord, who obviously is good if it were anything less, he wouldn't be omnipotent. If it were anything less, he would be, not be omniscient. If it were anything less, he would not be God based on the definition of God. He would not then know all things if he didn't know what you would choose. Therefore, um, any int- that's what we were all taught in Exteanity 101. But that's false teaching. That's... Right there, I can dismiss the entire Christian church, all denominations, as being false, right on that premise alone, that God didn't know Adam was naked. He was asking, where are you, Adam? Right there in the interpretation of Genesis 3, I could say uh, with total accuracy that the teaching of Genesis shows me that the church, what they call the church, which doesn't technically exist, got off to the wrong, in the wrong start. Even the churches of Asia are not the churches of today. Those churches of Asia, the only one that really existed was Philadelphia, which is symbolic of the church of the heart. In other words, the believers of the Lord. All the other ones had corruption, and the Lord said he would bring those people through. And I'm not telling you they're not going to be brought through. I'm just saying through your free will, that you know, what is and what isn't. These people... If the Lord draws them, then, you know, when they're 50 years old or 60 or 70, that's fine. It's not my business either, folks. And so I don't count out that that could happen. People say, well, Barack Obama is so evil. How can you say he's a prodigal son? How can you say he belongs to the Lord? And I'm like, well, the Lord told me to pray for him and that um, he was a prodigal and, you know, pray for him to be a good leader. So I've been praying that as much as I can't stand Barack Obama, personally, and that's probably something I have to work on because the Lord doesn't want me to make a judgment about anyone one way or the other. One way or the other. Um, but just personal animus, it's a, yeah, I don't, if it were me in the White House uh, and the people were suffering economically, I would give, I would give up, I would do what George Bush did. I'd give up golf. You know, I would, uh, I would not spend so much on vacation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just flaunt it in front of the people, like lord it over them in that way. Um, I would go modest and I would try to be an example of, of uh, someone that is cost cutting and is trying to, you know, give an example to the other people that they've, you know, it's time to tighten our belts and, and this is what we have to do and be a leader in that regard. I wouldn't be some ki- like a king and, and despot queen and, Ooh, it's so ugly. I it infuriates me to watch it. But I mean, it's it's there. I believe because it infuriates people that maybe God wants to infuriate. So maybe in some way He wants to infuriate us. But anyway, truth be told, I I can't stand that. You know, I can't stand the guy. The, watching him in the Middle East, um, he's made uh, all diplomacy a joke. He's absolutely the most pathetic, uh, misguided, lost soul that ever tried to do a foreign meeting in the name of this country and is an embarrassment to every other president. I mean, every other president is better than this one. There is no stature left to the office of the presidency thanks to him and his high school shenanigans. He never left high school. Apparently, he's still mad at everybody and he wants to get even and that has occluded his presidency and there will be no legacy. 
He wants to be like Lincoln. He is, is so far away from Lincoln or Kennedy or any of these great presidents that we've had. He is a million miles away from even being considered to be like that unless the news media just keeps lying because and my theory about that is because the news media is racist. So they employ reverse racism. In other words, because he's black, they're going to go overboard because they know they got a problem or some kind of white problem I, that, that I don't know anything about because when the Lord delivers you, there is no white and black and, and, and there is no differentiation between the races, folks. You know, I'm reaching out to people of all colors all the time. I don't see color. It doesn't even it doesn't even actually exist except that it's imposed on us from the left. It's this left wing white people who tend to be very racist when you talk to them privately. They're saying like, you know, the somebody I know around here calling all these Mexicans names. You know what I mean? And then and then she's total leftist and then it's calling all these people these the racist names and then hiring them to do the work and then acting and then going and voting because then voting left wing because she's proving that she's not a racist because she voted for Barack Obama and yet she's slinging around these racial slurs and I've caught a lot of the leftists doing the same thing behind the scenes you know actually saying the n-word and this word and that word showing me that you know these white people they're really racist. And so they become leftists to cover that up. And then they reverse racist. Like if Barack Obama, then they're going to go overboard pretending that he's the ultimate, you know, giving him props that would be reserved for a great hero or whatever. Even though he had, you know, like for example, great example was giving Obama a Nobel Peace Prize before he ever did anything. <laughs> I mean, nobody does that, right? That's racism. It's reverse, called reverse racism, but it's, uh, you know, it's only of the left. It's really not, you know, I suppose there are, you know, conservative law, you know, God-loving, constitution-loving people that are, um, well, I've never met one that was actually didn't like people because of their skin. I can't, I would, you know, the one thing about me being uh, brought up by, um, by dogs in other words, I didn't have any upbringing. I had to bring myself up. So by by uh, basically having no upbringing, they couldn't inculcate me with that crap, you know. And um, the TV tries to be right. Ra- the TV is very racist, creating all kinds of stereotypes. Like I just saw a movie yesterday where Koreans or Asians are the enemy. You know what I mean? They're awful villains. I mean, that's the message. It's probably not even... You know, intentional on their part, it's not going to bother me. But I can just see a lot of people thinking now, you know, these these sneaky North Koreans. But the North Koreans look like the South Koreans. And, they, they, they you know, so it's it's now the Asian villain appearing that wants to take the White House. It was called uh, Olympus Has Fallen. Came out yesterday. And a nice action film. Uh, music sucked. You know what? It's like in all these action movies, like Die Hard and like... This one, it's just, you know, what is with the music? Why do they put the perfunctory, every tired, shop-worn gags on each scene, predictably, when a cool score would have been awesome with this flick? Anyway, it was it was well-directed, you know, well-acted. Gerald Butler was really great. And, uh, you know, it just shows me that, you know, we do need, uh, you know, the... the, the um, we do need um, well, that our military in the United States could be taken out by a few uh, terrorists. That Goliath could indeed be slain by David. That America is too big to understand the moving parts. That um, a lot of what's wrong with the American military is corruption. So in my view... We need everyone to be God-fearing and choosing to be on God's side of the thing. And then the Satanic thing should not exist at all, anywhere. The one good thing is that the plane that was attacking the White House crashed into the, you know, they shot it down. They shot a missile at it and it blew it, blew its tail off. And on its way down, it took out half the Washington Monument. And I said, yeah, now we're making progress. And the final scene, you see, you see scaffolding around it. Well, they're, they're rebuilding it. And I'm going, you people, do you never learn? 
Satan cannot deliver us. Why don't they understand that? Anyway, the obelisk, if, if, if you brought me here from Mars and you just showed me wa like Washington, D.C. without any people in it, I would predict that they would be doing abortions from the architecture because you have to sacrifice children to these gods to get their favor. Gods, you know, demons, whatever, uh, fallen ones. And uh, I, would, I would have predicted there would be human sacrifice and war without end. And that's not what we want. We want to um, you know, have peace through strength, I believe, is the, the way to go. We should have a very strong military because of the threat that's out there. But we need people to be God-fearing. We don't need witches having their constitutional rights protected to practice their religion in the military because witchcraft is a division uh, and a lie and basically will destroy er everywhere it's put into place, every village it's tried, every place it's tried, it causes the thing to collapse, to fail. Why would anyone allow witchcraft in the military? It will only be a recipe for the military to lose wars, period. And I started to see how the, the program now is to make the United States look weak in foreign policy and attackable. And the, the people, the dumbass idiots here in this country are nodding their heads up and down, going, yeah, it's, I need to have gay marriage. Well, well the thing that's really at the, at the door is the attack. And I think this film probably did you know, a, a good service in the sense of showing how you ha freedom has to always be protected through the vig vigilant. And when it when attacked, after we were attacked, seemed to me that all the generals and all the brass and all the, rather, all the, um, you know, the uh, police and all the, everybody seemed to come together as one. You know, then, then in that day, when you're under attack, there is no Satanism and games going on. We're just trying to survive and we have to cooperate together to get it done. And that's a beautiful thing. That's all we ever long for, if we could just work together to accomplish, you know, goals. And if we could individually pursue happiness and, and uh, whatever it is our dream is without being told what to do and hampered down by a totalitarian regime, I mean, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? And that we could all be bros and sisters and brothers and kids and everybody just kind of like recognizing that they, we see the same things in each other and we all kind of want the same things and um, cooperation together and, and love flowing between the uh, people. But it's the exact opposite. It's every man for himself. You know, it's anyway, there's no solution I have. I'm just trying to show you today. On the one hand, I began with the book of Revelation to just show you that um, those people making, saying da they're damn sure. They're just damn sure. This is it. Are mistaken. And I'm here to say it's always it. I'm not saying this is not it. I'm going to say it's always at every generation. But you saw the multi-layering in there. You saw Revelation 8, for example. You saw then the seals, and then we go do a, a Revelation 8, the woes. And then we see all these plagues, and then finally we wind up with the Feast of God and the Fall of Babylon. It's, it's just all n nightmarish horror. But you, if, you just, if you add up the numbers, it's about 91% gone. And we're not even at the gate yet or the countdown of any kind of, you know, what the Bible would call the great tribulation, a la what the Bible says, or the Antichrist or the two witnesses or any of that. And um, the two witnesses would be there before the advent of the Antichrist. So if I see those and people say, well, they're doing this, and it's like, no, no, we need to see them bringing fire from heaven and taking out anybody that blasphemes God. I mean, that's, that's I, I don't think that is symbolic. You know, I mean, it might be in symbolic in terms of how many people are involved, but I mean, um, I don't see it being symbolic in terms of the actual events that occur, nor do I think it's symbolic about the angels and the different woes that those are symbolic. I think the angels may be a metaphorical way to look at it, but I do believe that there will be plagues and, you know, the sea, when I see the sea, a third gone or humanity, a third gone, um, I will start to Probably, uh, if I'm still around, say, yeah, this looks pretty, pretty bleak. But then again, 
I'm forbidden to time the end because Jesus told me. He said, no man knows the time. You have to always be ready, the tale of the wise virgins. Have your lamp oil in your lamps. You need to be ready for the Lord return at any time. And surprisingly, the return is incomprehensible to us. So we keep thinking that he's going to come down in a, in a little ship and walk around with his beard and his robe and stuff. And, and people are just sadly mistaken. That's not the return of Christ. That is not what it is. It's not even close. So therefore, I think I can write off most end times Christians as being sadly in error. And I know they really want the end because they just can't stand this world anymore. But I would, I would tell them and I would redirect toward them and say, look, there's a lot of really great things in this world. And maybe what you need to do is count your blessings rather than cursing everyone and everything and count, count the good things in life. And there's a lot of them. Um, you know, one of the bad things in life is the curse of death upon us all that we're all going to die eventually either of sickness or old age. Well, there's, you know, or some calamity. And that's just unfortunate. But, you know, we live with that kind of end times prophecy on our heads, each one of us. But it's the people that make the best out of this situation that actually thrive. You people that belong to the Lord, you need to not take personally what the world does or doesn't do. And you need to not be invisible. You already are invisible to a certain extent if you've chosen the Lord. I mean, I noticed that that when I chose the Lord, that was the result that occurred right after that. I had a definitely a beginning, middle, and end where I was fairly visible. I go to parties. I would have parties. I do things. You know what I mean? And I was there. But then after this event happened where the Lord took me, he really chose me and took me. After he took me, and I said, yes, of course. After he took me and I said yes, then like the next day, this situation I'm talking about manifested itself and has been there ever since <laughs> in different forms. And so it's bigger than us. It's not personal. And it should not preclude or occlude you from, um, that's not a good word, occlude, but preclude you from going uh, to and fro upon the earth anywhere that thou wilt, you know. Uh, because thou art under God's will. So if you want it, I believe God's directing you most of the time. If you belong to him, if you've prayed up, Lord, please don't direct me the wrong way. I think I'm going to go over here or go over there. The Lord wants his people to be visible even and, and to be kind of like a thorn in the side in a way. Because, and the reason you're a thorn in the side is because you remind people and you make them feel guilty because they see the light in you and they know that that enhances the darkness in them. And darkness is death, friends. Those who worship the darkness are dead and they don't exist. They know when they see you that they could have chosen differently. But then they justify their choice to say they couldn't get that good job at Walmart unless they did uh, choose the devil. And then when they see somebody else getting a free, they don't have to bow down to the devil and they got that job. They tend to go on the war path. You know, and if everybody did that, what they did, there would be no reason for the Lord to return. Hence, that's the game. And that's what Satan puts in their head. So that's what they do. What they do, whatever their program, the people that don't exist will do whatever they're programmed to do. They're not their own on their own recognizance. They go where they are told to go. They say what they're told to say. And they don't deviate because they don't want to get in trouble. Because when they get punished, it's really severe. So they tend to toe the line. And if that means coming down on you because they see you or the, the thing that's in them says, hey, see that person over there? Go, go rain on that parade. And so they'll, they'll get two or three of you and start doing some theatrical stuff, you know, some gaslighting, right? So from the gang stalking community, that's how that seemingly random event can occur just like that or three or four people are contacted through the spirit and they just go there you can say if you like it's electronic contacting same thing they're contacted the people that do the gang stalking are contacted electronically to bully you so four or five from di disparate areas of the parking lot will come just block your car so you can't get out <laughs> we've seen that over i mean that, that's like every every other day <laughs> something like that going on but i just tend to turn the radio on and chill out and start grooving to my favorite tunes and just realize this is Yahweh's bat and his ball, man. This is his thing. He made that line, that division. It's, I didn't do it. 
as far as I would just like to hug everybody, say kumbaya, game over, we're all friends, let's take our masks off and, and be real with each other. I would love that. But, you know, he doesn't want that. So we aren't going to do it. Sorry. Then the other thing he wants is he wants me not to hate anybody. Well, if they're not there, I can't hate them. So I see his strategy there in my heart. If they're not there to hate or to judge one way or the other, I'm finding now it's equally as bad to judge good when they're not good as judge bad. It's, in other words, if we judge, judge any which way, like, oh, you're good and you're bad, we, we are in error half the time. Either way we go. Um, and so we can't hold grudges as well because, you know, it's just like we got to take the lumps. Sometimes the Lord will allow some, something to happen even though, yes, you didn't deserve it. But there it is. And just let it go. Let it go. Because you can't afford to hold on to it. If you do, you cancel God and, you know, you diminish him and you need him to get through. So it, what does it matter what happens? This isn't about this. It's about this becoming light thing, which is this is the process. And so rocks get thrown every once in a while. And then, and then there's smooth sailing and then another storm comes. Okay, fine. It's the people out there are like clouds or like storms. It's not, you know, you, vengeance belongs only to God. You can't be vengeful. If you are, it means you don't have the Lord. It just means that you've, you've, you've thrown the Lord out. You've thrown him under the bus. You're going to take matters into your own hands. Um, Look, you know, Elijah was mocked for his hair and he, and he, you know, and he sort of did the eye for an eye thing, you know, getting the bear to attack the kids, you know, or being part of it or not, certainly not doing anything to stop it, you know. Mm-hmm. And you could say that was protection of the Lord because the Lord will not be mocked. So the bears came after and killed the kids. But then he also slew the prophets of Baal, you know. Um, and I would say at that time, you know, maybe that's what the Lord wanted, but certainly Jesus and post-Jesus He's not going to allow us to slay personal, you know, people that a a scenario like the prophets of Baal with Elijah wouldn't happen today or Moses with the 3000. I don't believe it. You know, Um, I believe that that he said, you've heard it said before that an eye for an eye and a tooth for the tooth is the way of the world. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not true. You must forgive your enemies, love your enemies. So it's a. He also told Peter, you know, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. You know, instructing him not to do it the old way. Because if we are light and we are love, then we are not going to respond the way they respond. If we do, then we're no different. Then, then think nothing's changed. Then we've reverted back to being like they are, invisible, if you will, or nothing. But if you're invisible in their area, if you work really hard at something and you're really good at something and they won't acknowledge you. And I know geniuses in certain fields. I mean, geniuses. Far, far more talent than what's being touted as the best. And they can't get arrested. And they're lambs. You know, they belong to God. And they, they, that's where their heart is. His, their treasure is him. They don't need, you know, they're not going to have the world bowing down and say, you're the best. And I won't say what disciplines they're in, but uh, different disciplines, um, not just creative arts or whatever, but different disciplines. Uh, they're, uh, they have to expect nothing and be grateful for what they have, not going around lamenting that they're the best and they can't get arrested. They can't, you cannot go there. That's a killer. That will kill your walk in faith. If you're working in their industry, look, these people are what? They're, they're just, what I said, they're invisible. They're the best at what they do and they can't get arrested. They make a good living. But the actual accolades they deserve will never be gotten because of their position in the Lord and because of their, their invisible on that side, on that physics side of the world, Satan, whatever, but visible on God's side. But on Satan's side, they'd be invisible. So no matter what they do or how good they do it, no one will see it. They're technically not there. Just as the church or the modern 501c3 church or whatever is not there with God, it doesn't exist. So there will be no revival because there's no re-anything, there's no need for a revival. 
It's always as it's always been. There is no need for revival. Jesus will deal with the individuals there. It's not to say there's no hope for individuals that are being, I went through church. I went through rock concerts. I went through clubs and bars. I went through drunkenness. I went through drugs. I've gone through sex. I've gone through all these different things. These, the Lord's pulled me through all these different modalities of being. So you can't look at it as a collective. The Lord deals with people's hearts. He's going to deal with them, folks. He's going to deal with the pastor, his wife, his kids, and everybody from there on down. He's going to deal with the politicians. He's going to deal with the president of the United States. I pray for the president to be a good leader. I may not have seen that, but I'm just being obedient to the Lord that I prayed that. And I'm going to see, and I have already seen him working in Obama's life. You know, that you're dealing with somebody that uh, is highly mercurial. I, I don't think you can count out anything with him. It, it's very changeable. So I'm watching. Certainly... I'm happier today than I was a few years ago with him. I, I maybe, you know, maybe he's going to learn a few lessons about uh, that he's not the greatest thing since sliced bread or whatever. You know, maybe he's going to have a little comeuppance. But I, I'm not rooting for that. I'm just saying, Lord, please make him a good leader because I know that's what he wants to be. And in so doing, you say, why don't you pray for him to repent? It's like being a good leader would be repentant. It, inherently, including include inclusionary with all that would be a whole kind of change in values. And he has publicly said that he believes in the Lord, but is he the vaunted antichrist six, 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 the man of perdition who has come to rule the earth and take over Jerusalem and stand in the Holy of Holies and proclaim himself. God, I believe that he would have loved to have done those things, <laughs> but it's just prophetically. That's why I read the book of Revelation. It's, it's, not, it's not on the docket right now or for the next seven years. I mean, I mean the next seven years won't be the countdown or the next three and a half years. It's, there's no, uh, the rabbis all predicted, a bunch of them predicted that Obama was the man of uh, perdition, the Antichrist, that he would rule for three and a half years and that would be it. Well, he's now going another four years. So they were wrong. And um, now I said I wasn't going to talk about this again, but here I am. I haven't really been looking at uh, all the fear mongers lately, you know, but they need Obama to be the man of perdition. And one of the guys who's pretty popular on YouTube, he's pushing uh, the Vatican as the, the roots of all evil. The Vatican, um, all these churches, they say, well, what about the fact that on the rock of St. Peter would be built this church and the gates of hell shall not come against it, referring to the Catholic church. And it's like, well, the, Obviously, that's not the Church of Saint Peter because the gates of hell have already taken it over. So I don't, I don't. So obviously, that's not what Jesus was referring to. That's all. That's all you have to do to make the scripture ring true, right there. Uh, what about the um, Protestant uh, Church? Well, you know, the same thing goes. Uh, the Protestants tend to lift up Saint Paul more, and have, there's a conflict between Peter and Paul and carry through to this day in the Protestant and the Catholic Church. I say a pox in all houses. All of you, in other words, all of you are wrong. And uh, the Lord's going to work with us individually. And if he, if, if he uh, were to see these congregations today, he'd simply walk out. If he saw the Pope's coronation, he'd walk out. Are you kidding? He'd walk out. Anyway, the Pope, he said he wasn't going to give uh, communion, Holy Communion, uh, the Eucharist, to... Uh, um, abortionists and then he just did Biden and Pelosi are both baby killers they're murderers both of them and he gave these murderers these unrepentant murderers who claim to be Catholic abortion thus underscoring that abortion continues and how great it is so the Pope has already made his first corruption and his first huge mistake and you know he's just a man that's my point. And, you know, Pelosi and Biden are like all the abortionists. They're just people. Are they steeped in ignorance? Well, some of them know that this is a sacrifice to Satan. But most, I guess, don't know or they look the other way. And a lot of these doctors are so depraved. They, they want to pull the, the fetus out as late as possible and then murder it while it has a potential of... Uh, living on its own or breathing on its own, that's when they want to stick the dagger in. And you hear story upon story like that. And I'm like, abortion should be 
as in North Dakota, who's being blessed on all levels by the law. I think North Dakota is there to be the thorn in the side of the left who hates everyone and everything um, because they are prospering while Obama is punishing the nation. They are prospering. And on the docket in North Dakota is uh, a bill to end abortion, make it illegal. I say hallelujah to that. And I believe that if you and, you know, um, I hope that home Bible studies crop up more. I think those are wonderful and uh, apparently not tolerated by the state. Apparently, um, the Department of Homeland Security, if they find out anyone studying the Bible, they want to go shut it down. I I'm stand in shock and horror. The Janet Napolitano, the head of this beast, I was reading from the Bible at the, uh, uh, at the funeral after the shooting in, in Tucson, Arizona. She was reading from the Bible during the ceremony. The book of Isaiah, I believe. What the... It makes no sense. Uh, you can't make sense out of it. And with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and go. But I want to give you a Sabbath shalom, Shabbat shalom to those of you, the messianics out there, to you people in the uh, music thing. I've got my eye on you. Remember this about me. I have a producer's heart. That's a producer, you know. And uh, that that's it's. If you don't understand what that is, and you don't understand that I can work with anybody, you know. And I've got some some really good prospects for projects right now and um you know but i go at it as a producer and i play yeah i play keyboards i play drums i play different things that need to be on the track just like in the same way that bob rock played bass on a lot of metallica's studio tracks not in the uh you know when they were looking for a bass player and they were recording it was bob rock that had to fill in but he was their producer he was the one responsible for giving metallica the metallica sound See, that's what a producer does. There needed to be bass, so he plays the bass. Does he go out on stage and play it? No. <laughs> so that's it. But I've, I just was blown away yesterday. I, one, uh, one guy, I, I just I stumbled upon him. He was like a friend. I didn't even realize it. And he, um, then I figured out he was this musician on SoundCloud. I heard a couple of his tracks. I'm like, oh, God, I could really help this guy. He doesn't really understand what I could do for him. But he's a uh, he's phenomenal. It's an unbelievable artist, and um, so you see that's that's another exciting thing. I think uh, you know, and that for me, those are good things. Just like being at the ocean is a good thing. You know, being on a stand up paddleboard is a good thing. Body surfing is a good thing. You know, seeing the dolphins in the way. I can't lament my own death or complain about anything. The Lord is like the chirping birds. Is what He wants. He wants me to flaunt my happiness. So I'm doing it. I'm. T- I'm just, look, look, and I'm not going to digress any more than this. This will be my last digression, I promise. If, I can't promise anything. If I had known about this divide back before I had tried a few things, I would have been a lot wealthier. (laughs) Uh, I didn't realize Back in the days where I was struggling as a screenwriter and then, you know, a, a, bur- you know, a, a struggling filmmaker, I didn't realize that now I'm it all went back to my childhood and my denial that, that there could ever be a say. I just couldn't handle the idea that Satan would exist or that, the, the, you know, that everything that was in my face, I went into denial on and I became like a different person. OK, you can't blame me. I mean, it was like I would deny Rosemary's Baby. If all those events in Rosemary's Baby happened, and they did, and a lot more than that, a lot worse than that, and a lot more hive-minded, magical, weird, spooky stuff happened. Um, I couldn't handle it. So when dealing with Hollywood and, you know, and uh, not potentiating my potential is because I couldn't acknowledge there was Satan, so I couldn't sell out into it because I wouldn't acknowledge it existed, see? And people gently try to tell me, but you have to have, you know, join the rank and file to have a shot at it. And I, I didn't, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? I, said, I can't tell you what I'm talking about. You know, so we go around and around. Let me tell you, you coward. Let me tell you what you couldn't say. You have to sell your soul to the devil, literally, to, to just be, en- enter into admission. And then you have to fight your way out of the snake pit. And then whoever wins that wins the ball game. Had you told me that? and you did, I wouldn't believe you. And so I went on my own, trying to do my own projects and everything, and, and things were just, again, people said, oh, you're so good. Yeah, you're, 
you're better than most anyone in here. You're going to, you know, these, these scripture, right? These, this will really be home runs and blah, 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 and all that smoke. But, but no, they couldn't get a hearing nor the novels nor all the, the literary works I produced because there had to be, uh, they wanted you to sell your soul to be given a, even a Christian publisher wanted, required the selling of the soul, which makes perfect sense after what we've talked about today. Which, of course, is, well, in 2002, 2005, I couldn't believe that even. But now the Lord has gently shown me um, it has to be that way. It could not be any other way than that. And that draw makes people conclude that that's the only way. So they try to do a tweeny, believe it, mis- misunderstanding the message of the Lord in his physics, in his, in his science, in his, in his creation. In Genesis 3, in the book of Revelation, in all of it. Once you misinterpret one thing, if you misinterpret God in Genesis 3, then the rest of the Bible, you will fall short of having an accurate word, which is needed to guide the people to truth. But you don't want to because you want to keep them in your churches, which would be a lie. Which is not church. Church is the body of believers of Jesus wherever they are. Church is the body of believers. The, the church is really, let's go beyond that. Church is really those that belong to God, that, God's, that, that are God's. And uh, it doesn't mean recapping here so you don't think I'm some, you know, ironically being a hypocrite, judge, judging while telling you not to judge. God, I suspend all judgment. I mean, I, I use discernment and that pisses people off. But... Um, the bottom line is the Lord will deal with people, whether they're in the church, in the science building, in the church building, uh, down the hall, in the gym, wherever they are, the Lord's going to deal with them. Okay? Wherever they are, the Lord's going to deal with them. Wherever they are, you can count on it. The Lord's going to deal with them. The Lord deals with all of us because it's a process of going toward the light. Some people are on some level, others are on others. I just... You know, you can't be afraid, summarizing, to walk through the world just because they're going to pick on you because you're not a Satanist. You can't be, you know, call it what it is, Satanist. That is one that belongs to the devil who, who, who's technically and structurally sold their soul to the devil in exchange for the world's, for security, whatever it is. Who knows why people do what they do? They want something. They want a couple of free, a freebie or, you know, whatever, however, whatever stupid reason it is, they do it. And, um, you know, and, and then they realize it's bigger than them. This wall I'm talking about is bigger than you. Uh, rejoice in your invisibility, folks. Rejoice in it. I don't want them to choose me for anything. That would scare the hell out of me. I, I've had a steady diet of invisibility on their side, but visibility on our side. And I'm happy as can be. With the Lord, I'm just because He is light, and everyone in Him is light. I'm experiencing the thing you'll be experiencing after death. I'm already getting that now. So I got no enemies here. This is just it, the situation is impersonal as far as regards me. It's not personal. My mother and father weren't personal to me. There was just an arrangement, but they're not. It's not a, you know, uh, I don't hold any grudge, of, and 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 I would hope they don't hold a grudge against me. It's not personal. It's not about my mother, my father, my uncle, my uh, siblings, my, um, my, my wives, my, uh, yes, I've been married more than once, my, my daughter, my this, this. It's not about it conflicts between us for any reason or whether they raised me good or didn't raise me good. It doesn't matter because God is my shepherd. He's my, the raiser. He's my mother and father. He's my everything. So it's, it's done. There is no need for a grudge against anyone. Hence, I must love my enemies. I must... Put on Christ because that's the only way that I can experience more. I don't want to confuse this with the Masons. More light. <laughs> no more digressions. I love you. I'm praying for you. And uh, get out of here. A million men charge. They break through the line and hear the sound. Other men revolt. They cannot escape from the 
sound. Somewhere there must be a way out. A way to the light. Promised land.